In this tutorial, we're going to go through another five JavaScript practice exercises for beginners. Hi, this is James from Junior Developer Central and welcome to another session where we're going to go through some practice exercises with JavaScript, uh, mainly aimed at beginner level. Just before we get started, if you have a second, don't forget to subscribe to support the channel and for any future video tutorial updates. So let's get started with exercise one. So exercise one is simply uh, when you're provided with a year, uh, just return true or false uh, depending on whether it is actually a leap year. So I'm pretty sure you're going to know what a leap year is, but basically it's going to be a, a number like 2018 and a leap year occurs every four years. So if that number is divisible by four exactly, then we can say that it's a leap year. So this one's dead simple and I've given you a few clues as to how about going to approach this one. So pause the video now and code up a, a function or a program that will give you a, a true or false value for a leap year. And I'll see you in a second where we'll go through a solution. Okay, so I hope you found that one easy. Uh, it's a nice simple one for us to warm up today. Uh, and it's simply a case of creating a function. So something like it is leap year, which takes a particular value, which is our year and then just returns the uh, result of whether or not there's any leftover if we divide the year that's been passed in uh, by four. So using the modulus expression, uh, that will give us uh, any remainder once the year value has been divided by four. And if that's equal to zero, we can say that the year is exactly divisible by four and therefore it must be a leap year. So let's just do a few console logs to see if that's working okay. Okay, and looking at the results in the right hand side, you can see the only one that gave us back a true value was 2016, uh, which was the last leap year. So that's nice and simple. Uh, if you did have a function that included an if statement, uh, that's perfectly fine too as well. Um, but obviously using ES6 arrow syntax, you can just put that all on one line as an implicit return. Okay, so that's exercise one done. Uh, let's move on to exercise two for something a little bit more complicated. Okay, so for exercise two, uh, you're required to write a JavaScript program or a function uh, which compares two objects. And we're going to be comparing to see if they're equal. And the way we work out if they're equal is if the first object contains the same properties as the second one. Um, so the first object that we pass in must have the same uh, property names as the second one. But the second one might also have some additional properties which aren't in the second one. So they don't exactly have to match up in terms of the number of properties, just does the first object have the same property names that exist in the second one. So here's some objects just to illustrate this problem. So object A here has got uh, the keys, uh, the properties of A, B and C. Uh, it doesn't matter that the values themselves are actually uh, the same. We could change those up and this would still be equal to object B, uh, which also has A, B and C. Um, but A and B won't actually be equal to C because this doesn't have the same property names. It does have A and B, but it doesn't have a C and it has a D instead. So with this data, we need to write a function to compare the objects together. So A and B should return true and A and B with C should return false. So pause the video and have a go with this one. Um, you might need to go away and think about how you're going to actually access those properties of the objects and compare if they're equal. And if you get stuck or you want to see the, how I solved this, come back in a second and we'll go through a solution together. Okay, so I hope you got on okay with exercise two, obviously a bit more complicated than exercise one, but hopefully it's got you thinking about how to write a function that will access all of these properties within the objects. So let's first of all define a function that we can call to actually uh, do this comparison. So we've just got a blank function here that's called objects equal that takes in two uh, parameters, a and b, and that's what we're going to do our comparison with. So the key function that's built into JavaScript here that will be really handy for us is the object.keys function, which will basically return back the keys that are present in the object. So these are the properties that we have. So for example, if I was to do something like this. Okay, so you can see when that function runs uh, that we're actually passing in object A and object B and the object.keys function, you can see it returns an array of the properties that are contained within the object. And for object A and B, as defined above, uh, you can see that the keys returned are exactly the same. So all we really need to do now within our function is to take those two arrays and see if they're equal. 
So we could do a for loop and iterate through one of the arrays and make sure that they match up, but we don't actually need to worry about the position of these, so that might be a bit of a wasted effort in terms of checking each value in each position. Uh, but there's another way that we can do that using a built-in JavaScript function called every. So what the every function does is it takes a callback, so it iterates over every uh, value in the array, and you pass in a Boolean expression to it. So uh, if that expression is true, um, then obviously the every continues. But if at any point you get a false value back, um, the every function stops and you get a false value returned. And it's only when it gets to the end of the array that it then gives you a true value back. So the Boolean expression I've passed in is just accessing the property uh, as defined in key. So if that property does exist, then we get a truthy value back. But if it's not there, we get undefined. And so the every function fails and the whole object's equal function will return false. So let's just test that out with the other objects that we've got created already. Okay, so you can see in the console on the right hand side that the only expression that returns true is the first two objects, so A and B, because we can see they've all got A, B and C as their properties. But when we compare either A or B to the object C, because they don't have the matching properties, we get a false value back. If you did get a different solution, it'd be great if you popped it in the comments below, just uh, I was wondering if there are uh, many different ways to solve this, but to me this seemed a simple way to go about it. Okay, so that's it for exercise two. Let's move on to exercise three. Okay, so for exercise three, you need to write a program or a function to convert a CSV string uh, to a 2D array. So you'll receive a string like in the example there uh, where you've got rows of comma separated strings. And the idea being that each row is the first part of the 2D array. And then inside that, you've got an array of those strings. So go ahead and pause the video and try and create a 2D array with the string that's provided or create your own if you like. And I'll see you in a few moments where we'll go through a solution. Okay, so I hope you got on okay with exercise three. Uh, I did find a similar exercise like this online, which I've based this one on, and it did confuse me initially as to what they were actually asking. But by kind of thinking of this in rows and columns, uh, it makes it a bit easier to work out what you need to do. So if you got stuck, uh, let's go through a solution together. So I'm just going to create a function and I'll call it parse CSV. And it, the CSV will obviously just be the string that we uh, were working with. And this function is just going to take in that string as an argument. Okay, so when dealing with strings, uh, the, basically the only way to get them into a, an array, unless you're gonna do something crazy with the string itself, uh, is just to split it. Uh, so every string will have a function called split on it. Let's just put this onto another line. And so we need to split these into rows of data. So in JavaScript and pretty much any other programming language, you can split lines of text based on the end line character or the carriage return. So to specify a new line character, we just use a backslash and then n. And that will split that string into three different rows in our array. So I'm just going to run that now just to show you the result of that. So you can see the result here on the right hand side is we've got three items in our array and each one is a row from that initial string. But of course we need to make this a two dimensional array so we need to split these values here in each row into an array itself. So we could, if we created a for loop, loop through each of the lines that have been created and split them as well. But we can just use another JavaScript higher order function uh, which is map which basically changes each value in an array and it accepts a callback so we can just pass in a function and the function for each item in the array we'll call the value row and then we just simply in here just call row because this is the string that's just included in the array and we split that on the comma and you can see when the code runs again now we've got each row in its own array item and then inside there is an array with all of the strings separated into an array so again, this exercise seems quite complicated on the first part, especially when you start talking about parsing CSVs and things like that, but we're still dealing with strings and all we need to do is split it twice to get it into that multi-dimensional array. Okay, so that's pretty much it for exercise three. Uh, let's move on to exercise four. Okay, so exercise four is asking you to write a bit of JavaScript to generate a random hexadecimal color code. So we're thinking something like this that you would normally find in your web development projects. 
So this one's a bit more straightforward. Hopefully you've got a clear idea of what Nia's doing for this. So pause the video now and have a go at it and come back in a second when we'll go through a solution together. Okay, so I hope you got on okay with exercise four. Let's look at a possible solution. And the way I approach this one is first of all to create a helper function to actually generate uh, one single random hexadecimal number. So let's do that first. So of course a hexadecimal number is anything between zero and F. So when we get to nine, we don't go to 10, we actually go to A. And that's where you'll see those letters appearing in your CSS color codes. So I want to first of all generate a random number, so I'll use the math.random and I want to multiply that by 16 uh, to give me a number up to 16. So I want to round this number up as well because uh, the math.random will actually give me a fractional number which we don't want, we want a whole number. So I'm just going to use math.floor, so this is basically going to give me a random number between 0 and 15. And I'm going to call that a few times just to demonstrate what it's doing before we move on to just the final section of this function. Okay, that's great. So uh, that's exactly what I wanted. So the first number you can see coming back is 13, but that's not actually what we want. We want to convert that to, well, it would actually be a, a D in hexadecimal value. So there's something we can add on to our get random hex number function, uh, which will actually do that for us. And that is the to string function, which will actually convert our number into a string. But if we pass that in a number of 16, because we're dealing with base 16 numbers, that will actually convert it to a hexadecimal string for us. So running the code again, you can see we've got some numbers in there. We've got 7 and 3, but the numbers that are larger than 9 have actually been converted into the hexadecimal character for us. So that's just a little bit of a tip if you ever need to be working with hex values. Uh, the 2 string and 16 will actually convert a larger than 10 number into the hexadecimal string value. So with our helper function defined, we can actually move on to solving the problem. And all we need to do is call that uh, get random hex number function six times and put a hash at the start of the string. So we could create a for loop here and loop through six times and, and call that get random hex number function six times. But I'm going to use a trick we used in a previous practice exercises class, and that is to use the array dot from function which basically creates a new blank array that's six items long. And when we've got that array, what we can then do is map each item that's created to the get random hex number function. So essentially what we're doing is creating a blank array and running the get random hex number function on each item in that array and replacing the empty value with the result from the function. So once we've done that, all we then really need to do is join that array back together as a string and that will give us our random hex colour. So let's run some tests to see if that's working okay. So there you can see running the function a few times has given us some random hex colour values which we could use in our web development projects. So I feel like with this solution, it's kind of trying to make it a little bit more complicated than it should be uh, and making the actual function for get random hex color shorter just for the sake of it. Um, but if you have uh, any other suggestions or you came up with a different solution yourself, uh, just drop a link to your code in the comments and it'd be interesting to see how you approach this one. Okay, so that's exercise four done. Let's look at our final exercise, exercise five. Okay, so for exercise five, we're looking to write a function that basically returns true if the provided predicate function returns true for all elements in a collection. So basically what we're saying here is write a function that accepts another function and runs it against an array. And if that function that's passed in is true for all of the items in the array, return true overall. If not, return false. So for example, if we passed in an array of numbers, say one, two, three, four, five, and we passed in a function that went through each item in the array and said, is each item bigger than zero? Then our code should return true because one, two, three, four, five are all obviously bigger than zero. Uh, if we were to say, are all items in the array bigger than three, then we should get a false value back because one, two, three are obviously smaller or equal to three. So pause the video one last time and go and have a go at this one. There is a spoiler alert in that there's a really simple way to do this, but see what you come up with and I'll come back in a second and we'll go through a solution. 
Okay, so I hope you got on okay with this final exercise. And if you've done a bit of JavaScript work before in terms of the higher order functions that are available to you, you've probably noticed that there is already a function that exists that does exactly this particular task. So I'm just going to demonstrate that to you quickly now. So the function is called every, and you can see that in the console results that we've got, um, the first expression we passed in is, is every item in the array bigger than zero, which is obviously true. And then like we did in before we started the practice, uh, is every item in the array bigger than three? Well, obviously that's false. So if you wrote a bit of code that looks exactly like this, then that's great because you're obviously aware of this function. And it's probably sensible if this was asked as a task to use this function to complete the particular problem. But let's just say in a coding interview uh, you weren't allowed to use higher order functions or maybe you were prohibited from using the every function to solve this problem. Let's look at a, a way that it could be done using a more traditional for loop. Okay so I've just created a function and I've called it is every lm. So every element is basically in the array is going to match a particular function that we pass in and my function takes two values the first being the actual array we want to check and the second is the function that we are going to call on each item which should return true or false based on a certain condition so within our for loop i'm just going to loop through every item in the array and for each item i'm going to do a check and i'm going to say is the function if we pass it in the value of array and the item at our particular index if that is not true if it doesn't return a, a truthy value then we know that the, the condition that's been passed in as the function has failed, so we can return false and break the for loop and return false from the function overall. So if that's not the case, we continue with our for loop, and if we get to the end of the for loop without actually returning false, we know that every item in the array has, has met the condition passed in the function, so then we can return true. So let's try some examples and see how that works out. And you can see when we run the code again, uh, we're still passing in those same expressions and the same arrays, and we still get a true and a false value back for each one respectively. So as I said, whilst there is the every function available, if for some reason you weren't able to use that, this is a way of solving it. But I think it's quite interesting as well because you don't tend to typically pass functions into other functions. But that's one of the things with JavaScript that it does let you do that. And then you can call that function that you've passed in to perform some other operations within your code. So that wraps up exercise five and indeed this JavaScript practice session. I hope you found this useful and you've learned something about arrays and JavaScript. Just before you go, don't forget to subscribe to support the channel and to receive future video updates and I'll see you next time.